Hi, uh, I'm Paul Otakook, and we're doing the next little coffee break, 5 to 15 minute thing. And today is on acronyms and Alaska Natives. Well, we know that the federal government loves acronyms, and so does the state government. So there are a lot of them, but there are some that are particular to Alaska Native communities. And we just wanted to introduce a small sample of those. A part of what's useful about this for educators is that you will hear these kinds of acronyms around the community if you're spending enough time there uh, interacting with people. And they can be very confusing and it might be odd to just ask about it. So what we thought we would do is at least start the process of helping to unfold these. A part of the benefit of knowing the acronyms is that you have to know something about the organization that they're referring to. So it gives you context. So one of the ones I love to start out with is AFN, which is, of course, the Alaska Federation of Natives. The most important parts of knowing about AFN is, one, it's always the third week of October, uh, so that makes it pretty easy to plan for. The elders and uh, the elders and youth part of AFN start, I'm trying to remember, uh, I think it's Monday through Wednesday. Typically, I think that's in place. They, the AFN conference itself takes place in either Anchorage or Fairbanks, and it alternates from year to year. What's unique about it historically is I don't know of any other group of Native Americans or American Indian tribes that are quite as united as the Alaska Federation of Natives is in trying to move the ball, trying to promote the interests of Alaska Natives at both the federal and the state level. It helps to have a unified voice if you're going to be tackling things at the state level especially. And it's a rare and amazing thing that we have it. It's part gossip, part collecting, great art, great crafts, some great traditional foods. It has its political function, of course, as well. And it's a chance to have prominent leaders from outside the Alaska Native community to come and present themselves to an Alaska Native audience. I think that has a significant impact on the direction of the state and the federal government's recognition and understanding of certain issues that, that as Alaska Natives were, were trying to deal with. So, AFN started in 1966 and still going strong. The next one might surprise people. It's the Atomic Energy Commission. The reason why it's so relevant, of course, is a couple of things in Alaska history. One was Project Chariot, which was a proposal that actually went as far as surveying, doing scientific studies, and doing some geologic testing by uh, installing a drill site. It's between Point Hope and Kivalina on the coast of Alaska. And it was a project promoted by Edward Teller, the father of the hydrogen bomb, as a way to show peaceful purposes for the United States atomic weapons. We were trying to distinguish the American control of atomic weapons as good bombs, while the communist bombs were bad bombs. So that's quite a challenge to just find a useful non-warlike purpose for these bombs. And what they came up with is what is phrased atomic engineering. And in this area of western, northwestern Alaska, everybody's known that there are just amazing geological resources there. But there's no natural harbor large enough to handle the traffic that would be needed to take advantage of that. So that's a wonderful combination in their minds. We're going to use the, the Atomic Energy Commission proposed 
firing off one huge bomb and then several small ones. The huge bomb would create the harbor and a chain of small ones would uh, create the uh, entry into this uh, artificial harbor that would have been made. It would have contaminated a number of villages. Most of Northwest Alaska would have been evacuated from Kotzebue up to Kivalina and all the way into Kobuk. And those communities were proposed to be moved to Nome for an indeterminate period of time. Indeterminate period of time is the same phrase that they gave to the residents of what is the Bikini Atoll. And it took them more than 50 years to be able to return. And you only could be an elder to be there. And you can't eat any of the seafood, even today, around the island. So what's the point? The point was to legally say, well, we've allowed them to come back in. So the Atomic Energy Commission has quite a history. Of course, they've done uh, tests of atomic bombs in other places, but they also did one in Amchitka. Uh, they used Amchitka Island uh, as a as a place for testing their weapons too. So the the Alaska Native Claim Settlement Act, it's best understood as somewhat like our treaty with the United States. The U.S. takes lands from Alaska Natives, grants title to some of our former lands, and then paid us $962.5 million for the taking of all those other lands. It's a very misunderstood thing if you think of it as the U.S. gave Alaska Natives land. It's really the reverse. Alaska Natives are giving up most of our traditional lands and we're being paid a fraction of its market value in order to do this. That happened in 18 December 1971. Attached to it, and within the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, is this document or this provision, it's provision 17D2 of the Alaska Native Claim Settlement Act. And 17D2 is what it took to have conservation groups go from being opposed to the Alaska Native Claims to being supporters of it. And what that section did is that it promised that at least 85 million acres would be considered or parks, preserves, and other restricted uh, uses. That D2 controversy was the conservationists spending time just rolling through, learning about most of the places they did not know about in Alaska, and they went kind of on a shopping spree. They had 120 million acres that they actually wanted as parks, preserves, and wildlife areas. The problem for them was Jimmy Carter was a one-term president, and the president, the, the president-elect was Ronald Reagan. So they knew the curtain was closing on the acquisition of more lands. So they settled for a, about 102 million acres of land as a part of Anilka. And that's the way to understand it. And Nilka is a footnote of the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. Very quickly, the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium, the wonderful hospital and services that are uh, here in Anchorage, the Alaska Territorial Guard, which was the statewide organization of Alaska Natives, American Indians, and Aleuts, who were the eyes and ears of the military in World War II for the coast of Alaska. The BIA, of course, Bureau of Indian Affairs, it's a long history, some of it's sorted. 
but at least you know it's there. CDQs are community uh, development quotas. And what's happened is the Bering Sea has become a factory area for uh, a harvesting of several species of fish and crab. A small portion of that revenue that is based on the Bering Sea area is actually shared with coastal communities of the Bering Sea so that they will have some funds to invest uh, to better their communities and better the opportunities for the residents of, of those communities. Siri, of course, Cook Inlet Regional Incorporated, one of the 12 regional corporations that were formed under ANCSA. Here's a fun one. DEW, the Distant Early Warning System. Once the Soviets had the atomic bomb, how would they actually deliver it, their bombs to the United States and if there were uh, a, an atomic war? Well, the short direction was to come over the pole. And the response to that was to put a string, like a necklace, of radar sites along the top of Alaska, uh, western Alaska, and actually over into Canada and Greenland. These were the first real establishments by the federal government in many of these communities. They created jobs. There were people who initially had to man the sites, needed actually people there to oversee them. They, uh, would spend a substantial amount of time sort of in the building. Many of them had bowling lanes as a part of the recreation for the people who, who uh, were assigned to those spots. But it was a, it was a very important source of interaction between Alaska Native communities and the federal government at the community level. It has far reaching effects, uh, even to this day. One of the sad ones is, they dumped a lot of chemicals that were used on those sites on the ground. And we're, we are still cleaning that up decades later, and it will take decades more. FWS, Fish and Wildlife Service, anything that you do uh, for the, in the villages, a lot of it rests on hunting and fishing and gathering things. And so the Fish and Wildlife Service is an, an important component of the federal government and how intelligent they are about traditional use in hunting and fishing and gathering uh, is important for Alaska Native communities. We have to somehow communicate better with them than we do currently. The ICC, it's not the Interstate Commerce Clause, it's the Inuit Circumpolar Council. In 1977, Evan Hobson, who was a very significant Olympiad politician, uh, proposed a meeting between Eskimos from Greenland, Canada, Russia, and the United States. It was hosted in Barrow, and from that, we now have a formal organization, the Inuit Circumpolar Council. Next is the IHS, it's the Indian Health Service. Enough said. Then there's the Marine Mammal Protection Act, which is very important for the exception that's included. In general, it's stopping the hunting of marine mammals. However, when it was passed in the early 1970s, Alaska Natives were substantially committed in these coastal villages to marine mammals, continued use. So we have an exemption that's included in that. It includes sea otters, it includes polar bear, walrus, seal, and so it's very important that that provision is still there because a lot of our meat is coming from there. And there's the National Park Service. They're a big impact because Anilka created so many parks, and so they are now surrounding uh, villages and uh, the hunting and gathering places are part of uh, what is inside these parks. So with uh, 
these last two. We have the Indian Reorganization Act, or the IRA. This was a reorganization of the relationship of the federal government with Indian tribes. It was under FDR's administration, so it's occurring in the 1930s. His administration is trying to change the relationship of the federal government with that of the American people and with corporations and industries. It's also in the midst of that, changing the relationship between Indian tribes and the federal government. And it's moving the federal government from wanting to destroy Indian tribes to instead be partners with Indian tribes in assisting the creation of a better life for Indian tribal members. It was passed in 1934, but in 1936 it was amended to include the Alaska Native tribes. It's under this act that many of the tribes in Alaska, for which we have over 200, are recognized by the federal government. It's very important. They continue to exist today. Finally, there's the regional education attendance areas. This was an attempt by the state of Alaska to localize the educational experiences of Alaska Natives. Prior to this, they had a perfect acronym for uh, education delivery in rural Alaska. It was called uh, the State Operated Schools, or SOS. And it was that that was broken up into regions and under the state, and they became school districts of a sort. They're more limited than school districts, which is why they're called uh, regional education attendance areas. So those are just some, it's not all, but at least it'll give you a good start on trying to recognize these important acronyms and what they mean uh, within Alaska Native communities and what they mean for Alaska Native communities. So, thank you.